Good afternoon. Welcome to the webinar Global Trends and Deployment Statistics. Um, the speakers will be Carlos Martinez. Carlos is CTO at LANGNIC. Sorry. Um, here is the agenda for the activity. Uh, next uh, to this brief introduction will be starting and the presentation lasts 50 minutes approximately. The webinar will be recorded and the next day you can access the video. There will be a, a, a question and answer session after the presentation, then please feel free to write your question or comments in the section button of the screen. And you see it uh, is uh, on the screen. Well, uh, shall we can I start, Carlos? So, I will say that uh, we will have a very gentle idea for uh, the day we find a place to play for the session. And we have decided to play a video to some of our members and let them know that this was actually going to happen. And I think we have some really fun and funny and uh, for people like uh, we, we take it for us is really, really now this year. Uh, and that was the video that we won actually. And the next one is even better. We didn't know that we were going to um, we have no plans to do the physics, um, we just wait and see what I'll do. Uh, this is, and, and this is the third one, this is what I'm uh, going to be thinking a little bit about the uh, need for actual numbers. Um, the fourth one is interesting because this, this was the only person who actually had thought about the issue. I disagree with this. With these Take on it, and uh, he said that he was going to use current lane not to actually extend the life of it before. Uh, but nevertheless, I have to give him that uh, he has actually thought about the problem. So, uh, if, if you look at the third answer, uh, we'll just wait and see what others do. Um, it becomes important from our point of view to be able to actually tell people what other people are doing. So, it's critical to have evidence in order to actually present a case either to your government, to your uh, management about uh, deploying IPv6. The question of what other people are doing is bound to come up. Uh, because uh, reasonably enough, uh, many companies don't feel the need to be the first on something that they do not immediately perceive the value of um, and moreover, it's always good to know what your competition is doing and what problems they may have found in the way. So there are two, two numbers or two statistics that are critical for this uh, IPv6 and IPv4 runout uh, processes. To have actual IPv6 deployment statistics from different points of view, I'm going to talk about three different numbers that you can see related to IPv6 deployments, and um, numbers related to IPv4 availability and some runout predictions. Uh, it's always good to know when it's finally, finally going to run out. So um, it's it's good to, I mean, the, the question how much IPv6 is deployed in the world is actually a question that has no single answer. Uh, there are different things to measure and different different points of view where to measure measure it from. And uh, the numbers actually, you have to be very clear about which numbers you are using because uh, otherwise uh, they are not very comparable. So um, this is a very simplified model of the internet. You imagine that you have users, you have an ISP, which is basically a company or someone who actually provides access to the internet. Uh, you have content providers. Usually the way the internet works is that you have users, you have service providers, and these users want to use the service provider to get the content. Obviously, I mean, these distinctions are not that clear cut. There are many ISPs who also have content on their own. 
and, and there are content providers who also are ISPs in some places, like for example, Google as Google Fiber in the United States. So, um, and above all, there's this guy on the top left, the external observer, which is basically us. I mean, uh, us, LACNIC, or many of the governments around, for example, or decision makers and uh, policy makers in the region, are basically external observers. We are, we are not ISPs, and we are not content providers, and in some cases we are users of the internet, but uh, again, our experience as a single user is, uh, is of little value. So, the question that this external observer usually wants to know, I mean, the first, the first thing that comes to mind is how many megabits per second or gigabits per second uh, use the unit that you like the most? It's uh, trafficking over IPv4 and how much of that is trafficking over IPv6? And this is a question that for an external observer it's impossible to answer unless you go and ask the ASP for actual information. In that case, you may get an answer or you may not. Some ISPs may not want to actually make that information public. And in the end, you'll see that if you're a decision maker or a policy maker, that is not necessarily a, a number that is that useful. So, a while ago, um, a researcher in Australia, uh, whose name is Jeff Houston, came up with the idea that this number in megabits per second is not that useful, but there is another number that can be observed from, the, from an external point of view, and it's actually more useful, which is how many users in this population of users do actually have access to content available on IPv6. So, uh, we call this number the proportion of users with IPv6 because we are going to express this in a percentage, and this percentage means that out of 100% of internet users in company X or country Y, uh, this percent has actually access to content on IPv6. So, again, why is this useful? Because actually this, this, is, a, this is a more meaningful way of expressing how, many, how much IPv6 is deployed um, or how widely IPv6 is deployed in a given company or a given region or a given country. So, um, what I'm going to describe next is not something that we invented, it's something that has actually developed at Epinic, which is the sister organization to LACNIC, but in Asia Pacific. Uh, then you have a link uh, with, to an article which actually describes in uh, technical detail how all of this is implemented. But I'm going to describe this methodology from a high, high level point of view. Remember that the goal of this uh, measurement, of this experiment, is actually find out how many users have access to content which is available on IPv6. So, the, the Eureka moment, uh, this, this moment of illumination, came when someone realized that there is something that you can do on the internet that allows you to publish content worldwide and to actually control where it is published and how often it's published, and those are Google Ads. Interestingly enough, uh, with few exceptions in the world, Google Ads are distributed more or less uniformly throughout the world. Although you can control um, details, like uh, you prefer this country or that country, you can also say, hey Google, I want this uh, published everywhere. And what is a Google Ad, actually? It's basically a blog. Carlos, Carlos, sorry, Carlos, yes. sorry, excuse me, um, but uh, we we are showing, we are seeing the um, the second slide only. Is possible? I don't know. Ah, okay. Ahora sí, sí. Ok, las, de, las demás okay. slides no se pudieron okay. ver, eh, no, no estaban pasando. Ok. Es complicado, no es un problema. 
perdón, porque no sabía si era que lo estaba viendo yo así o, o los demás también. Sorry.
Uh, there are a few numbers here in this slide that uh, deserve a bit of an uh, explanation. Uh, the table on top, you see world and you see Americas, uh, the numbers that APNIC produces actually classify the world in and the world, regions, sub-regions, and countries. And uh, so this is uh, world has an average of 21% adoption rate, that's around one user in five in the world currently has access to IPv6 content. Uh, if you if we go to the Americas region, and this Americas region is uh, all the Americas uh, from uh, Canada to Argentina with the Caribbean and Mexico and everything in the middle, uh, the average adoption rate in this region is 34%, but this is mostly due to the adoption rate in the United States. If we look at South America, it's close to the world average actually. It's uh, 19% and the countries with the most IPv6 are uh, Uruguay and Brazil which is, are sort, sort of head to head uh, around 30% Ecuador 16 almost 17 Peru around 18 Argentina close to 9% and Bolivia close to 8% this again this means that one in three users both in Uruguay and Brazil have IPv6 in their homes uh, around 16% uh, in Ecuador have access, and um, this gives uh, the region average of uh, around 20%. Basically, if you look at this, of course, this means that Brazil, which has a huge population, close to 180 billion people, is pushing the average of the whole region up a lot, but there are significant uh, countries still with very low adoption rates, like for example Chile or Colombia or Venezuela are not uh, deploying anything with IPv6 at this point in time. If we move now to Central America and Mexico, the most interesting case there is of course Mexico itself, which is a rather recent deployment. Uh, it's um, close to 27%. It's been growing very, very quickly over the past uh, year or so. Um, the other success story is uh, Guatemala with 11% and there's, there's Belize with uh, closing, closing on 5%. Uh, this, this, all of these deployments are significant. Uh, it means that um, it will be very hard to go back. For example, in Mexico, when you have one user in four uh, using IPv6, it will be really hard to go back. Uh, the average of the region is around 21%, uh, which is, of course, heavily influenced by Mexico, which has a much larger population. And if we go to now to the Caribbean, um, now the, the average of the region is about five percent. It's much much lower than the average, the world average. And the interesting stories here are Trinidad and Tobago, which with are twenty two percent, which is not all at all. This is a very interesting deployment. Uh, Puerto Rico with twenty three. Although Puerto Rico is not, um, I mean, it's a success in terms of three six. I would say it's more tied to being closer to the U.S. Uh, Dominican Republic has. And it's, I would say, starting deployment around 1%. And then we have San Martin. This is the Dutch side of San Martin with a significant deployment of IPv6. Let me tell you a, a little bit about the US. Um, first of all, let me say why this is significant. Uh, as you all know, uh, our region depends a lot on. Um, the connectivity is through the US for the connectivity to the region. Uh, we use uh, North America based carriers for our interconnect. We use uh, CDNs there. And I mean, uh, what happens in the telecom networks in the US is in any way, or, and in some way or another, actually influence what happens in our region. And deployment in the US is now over 50%. It's um, close to. Um, 55% in the US and 25 in uh, Canada, excuse me, Canada, sorry. We can fix the slide. Um, this means that there is more IPv6 
traffic or users in the US and there are IPv4 users. And this is significant because if you are a carrier, if you're an ISP, uh, you are going to put more effort and more uh, resources into solving issues and to improve the quality of the uh, of your IPv6 enabled network, uh, and perhaps perhaps not so much in your legacy IPv4 base. Um, this is if you are buying service from a North American based carrier. This is something you should take into account because at some point in time, uh, probably IPv4 only service will become to be even more expensive than IPv6 or dual spectra. A few words about the rest of the world. This is interesting because, uh, you know, in the, the internet is, is built in such a way that what happens in a, uh, anywhere else in the network actually affects everybody, every one of us. Um, there are quite a few countries with large populations with very high, very high deployment rates. Uh, it's worth noting the case of India, which has a huge population. Uh, and it has around 70% of the users in India uh, now using IPv6. This is a few hundred million users, I would say. Uh, you have some of the, I would say, the usual suspects. I mean, the countries in Europe with high adoption rates, like Germany, France, um, Greece, uh, Belgium is not in the table, but it's, uh, it's the green spot, the small green spot around here. Uh, they have all very high adoption rates, and uh, you have quite a few cases in uh, Southeast Asia. For example, for example, in Malaysia, um, um, some of uh, the other countries there as well, Australia, uh, Japan. The, 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 the main takeaway of this slide is actually um, realizing that this is happening. I mean, IPv6 is being deployed throughout the world, and uh, we need to be prepared, even if we, as an individual ISP, don't uh, actually have a pressing need for new or more IP for others. So this is this is one of the kind of, of type of statistics that I was going to mention. That I was going to mention. Um, now I will move over to another number that you will see thrown around sometimes, which is uh, statistics provided by content providers. If you if you rem if you recall this simplified diagram diagram of the internet, uh, content providers are those who have what users want, if you will. I mean, you have YouTube with its videos, Facebook, the social network, Instagram with the pictures. And and the rest of them, some of those lowers and don't even know what they are, but they're social networks of them. So, um, many content providers actually publish uh, statistics on how much of their content is accessed over IPv4, IPv6. This is different, this is a different number from how many users that are using IPv6, because this this uh, particular view from the content provider point of view is uh, actually biased towards the content that provides. And so in some cases, these numbers will match, and in some cases will be very different from the numbers that uh, are presented in other, uh, in the user proportion. proportion. So for example, uh, Google publishes um, in this URL, and you can easily find it if you just Google for Google IPv6 ads, you will get to a page that has these maps. The greener they are, the more IPv6 they have. And more interesting, they have this trend graph, which actually shows how much of their content, I mean, this is everything Google, like YouTube, the search, uh, Gmail, and um, quite a few other web properties that Google has, how much of those, um, how much of the traffic, or the traffic they, they get is over IPv6. And you will see that it's closing on 30%. But this is users from all over the world accessing content in Google. They represent about a third of Google's traffic. Akamai, which is a very large content and delivery network, also has 
uh, some statistics that can be interesting. And um, again, these blue things here are uh, URLs that you can follow, or you can Google for for, uh, for these stats pages. Um, this is actually, I mean, this number it means the same thing. Uh, how much of the traffic from this network in the first case, for example, uh, Comcast, how much traffic Akamai is getting from Comcast over IPv6? Well, 70%. Um, these numbers will be very different from the user proportion numbers. I mean, the thing is they mean different things, and it's important to know the difference. Both are important, both are interesting, but they mean different things. Facebook, they have around the same thing, but for example, they actually report a number that is a bit lower than Google's for some reason. Um, it's around 27% or something like that. <coughs> um, this, again, this means that all the traffic that Facebook gets, around 27% of it, is over it. And now, let me talk a little bit about a third kind of number, which I call the statistics from an access point of view. Which actually, again, let me show you this diagram again. If you look at the users, now the question would be, what happens if I have a network which has only a PV4, and suddenly I enable a PV6 for it? How much traffic will switch to move over IPv6? And this is the question that we try to answer here in this particular case of this uh, third number, third type of statistic. So, so this is the experiment. We have a, a group of users. Um, they have um, computers of devices that are actually um, dual stack enable, they, uh, they, they have the software that need to actually run both protocol stacks, IPv4 and IPv6. And then we enable uh, both protocols for this network. And we actually, we don't tell the users anything about that. And we just let them be and uh, behave and do the same things they do usually. So um, let's say that the purple, the purple arrow is IPv4 only content uh, and the green arrow is traffic over IPv6. So the question I would like to answer is how much of the traffic, of the total traffic will come over the green arrow and how much will come over the total arrow? We've been performing this experiment for a few years uh, at the LACNIC conferences. Uh, the LACNIC conferences have grown a lot in terms of size and the types of use of uh, the network that uh, the assistants or the attendees do is very different from what it was 15 years ago. Uh, we usually have around 500 registered attendees, but this means we have around 900 devices connected to the network and this proportion, I mean, it's about 1.8 uh, devices per person tends to grow. I mean, people are bringing more devices to the to the Wi-Fi network, um, and this actually makes the experiment more interesting. And this is an actual measurement that we performed during our last conference in Lagnik 31 in the Dominican Republic. And the answer goes around this. You will get about two-thirds of your traffic over IPv4 and one-third over IPv6. And this is this is quite interesting. Um, obviously, there's a lot of um, dependencies on uh, the type of activities that the users uh, perform on this network. Uh, this network has a relatively low uh, use of video because you know people are in the conference and are looking at presentations and trying to get some work done, and they are not. Or most of them are most of them are not actually, for example, watching movies on Netflix. I bet someone are, but not many of them. So um, 
if you would perform this ex very same experiment on a network that has a heavy use of video, for example, a lot of Netflix customers, uh, Netflix has uh, content delivery over IPv6, uh, this proportion of traffic could be even on, go, or grow all the way up to 50-50. This, this is a significant number for, the 33% the 30, the is a very significant. Um, if you are an ISP and, and you are designing a network and you will need to, for example, implement a carrier renal solution to share IP, public IPv4 space among your users, this 33%, this one third of the traffic is traffic that will not need uh, to go to be translated. And that means that you don't need to uh, provision a CGM box uh, large enough for all your traffic, but you only need to provision a CGM box that is large enough for two thirds of your traffic. And this is, this is quite nice because that third of traffic that doesn't go through the DGN is traffic that you don't have to pay for in the CGM box. And CGM boxes are quite expensive also. Um, again, this depends a lot on um, the type of use that uh, these users uh, make of the network. If you look at a uh, strictly enterprise network, I mean an office network, probably these numbers are different uh, because probably the, the, the content on IPv4 uh, that users from a, uh, an office uh, use is probably higher. Uh, but again, if you go to a residential network um, with heavy use of video, the number over IPv6 probably will be much higher. So, um, I'm nearing the end of this presentation. I have one more number that is interesting if you are, particularly if you are an ISP and you're looking to buy new routers, for example. I'm going to show you a couple of numbers that are significant and uh, should, be, should be present in your design decisions. I call them routing statistics, and the numbers are these. Um, the question is how we How big is the routing table in IPv6? Um, well, um, the routing table in IPv6 is much smaller than the routing table in IPv4. But nevertheless, it's growing quite fast. Uh, as April of this year, there were 73,000 routes compared to seven. <clears throat> 730,000 routes on the IPv4 routing table, which means that um, the IPv6 routing table is about one tenth of the IPv4 routing table. But you can see that it's growing exponentially, and this is this is kind of worrying in a way, in a, in a way. Um, but hopefully, once everybody announces their IPv6 prefaces, the growth pattern will revert to a linear growth. Um, the IPv4 routing table is at uh, 750,000, more or less, routes. Um, but it's been growing linearly and not exponentially for the past uh, few years. So eventually, if this trend would uh, continue, Eventually, the IPv6 routing table will be will would become bigger than the IPv4 routing table. I sincerely hope that doesn't happen, but uh, we'll see. We'll see what the, what the future brings. Um, finally, um, as you know, LACNIC uh, assigns IPv6 prefix six to its member organizations. Um, but a good question would be, how many of those organizations are actually Publishing those uh, prefixes on the internet, uh, you can get that uh, number in uh, a web page that we have that we call Lightning Open Data. And the question, the, the answer to this question is about 40 percent, 42 percent of the prefixes that we have assigned lately are visible on the internet, and uh, it's, it's been growing. And um, usually, what happens is that the larger, I mean, the bigger networks are uh, Quicker to publish their prefixes, 
and the smaller ones, uh, smaller companies and smaller organizations take a bit more time to, to get the prefixes on the interview. Well, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I think we have a few minutes for questions now. Uh, sorry about the... Uh, Carlos? Carlos, can you hear me? Carlos? Yeah, uh, we have a question, okay. Carlos. Sure. Yes, yes I read. Uh, is, um, the question is from Aronik. Aronik uh, say, is uh, the, uh, the any plan for IPv6, IP, uh, IPv6 implementation in Africa? Carlos? Yes, uh, I, I, I can hear you very well. Uh, Sorry, Carlos. I think we will have a few other questions in the in the chat. Yes, uh, I read it. I read it uh, again. Uh, Aronik say, is there any plan for IPv6 implementation in Africa? So, um, in the case of Africa, uh, I didn't show any numbers. Um, there are um, there are some. Actually, let me show you the world map because there are a couple of countries. One of them is Egypt uh, that have some deployments of IPv6. Uh, this one is Kenya, I believe. Um, but those are, I think, the only ones who have uh, started to deploy IPv6. IPv, IPv um, I don't know exact plans uh, about Africa. Uh, you could probably ask uh, our colleagues at Afrinix, and they run a, a similar program of webinars to this one, um, and they will probably have uh, more accurate information than the, the one that they have for, for Africa. Okay, thank you, Carlos. Uh, so uh, this is the last question. The uh, we have uh, uh, only question. Um, please let me show the, the last slide. My last slide, please. Well, thank you for attending the webinar today. In the screen, you can see the contact email. Please feel free to send us any comment or suggestion for our webinar. It is very important for us to get it. Um, in the next days, you will receive the link with the video of this webinar. So uh, this is all for today. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you very much to all and have a nice day.